Welcome back, listeners, to Mosaic's Community Life Podcast, Life in Canada, Episode 5. My name is Jane Teasdale, one of the co-owners of Mosaic Home Care Services and Community Resource Centres. I would like to introduce my guest today from the International Federation on Aging, Mr. Greg Shaw. His role in the IFA is International and Corporate Relations of the International Federation on Aging. Before I interview Greg today, I just wanted to highlight a bit of background on the IFA. The International Federation on Aging is an international non-governmental organization with a membership base comprising of government, NGOs, academics, industry, and individuals in 75 countries. The IFA began operations in 1973 at a time when the social and economic impact of population aging was only beginning to be understood by governments around the world. I would also like to provide a quote from Mr. Graham Pryor, President of the International Federation on Aging, which I pulled from the IFA website. And he quotes, It is time to take action and fight for the rights of older people all over the world. On this podcast, we will be finding out about the work the IFA is working on and about the 15th Global Conference on Aging, Rights Matter on November 9th to 12th in Niagara Falls. This conference can be attended virtually or in person. And welcome, Greg Shaw, and thank you again for taking the time to chat with us on this podcast. I know how busy you must be preparing for the upcoming conference, and I have many questions to put forth in this interview. So let's get started. Greg, are you able to highlight some of the work the IFA has been doing in Canada? and around the world, especially with respect to the rights of older persons through U- the United Nations in Geneva and the World Health Organizations. And how does the IFA's relationship with the World Health Organization work with regards to the decade of healthy aging? Thank you, Greg. Well, there are quite a few questions. So thank you very much. And thanks to Mosaic for the opportunity to talk with you today and your readership and listeners. So I'm very pleased to talk about the IFA and the work that we do. And you're right, we've been around for a long time, since 1973. But for many organisations and older people, people would know about the UN principles for older persons, which was endorsed by the UN in 1991. And it was those principles which were really drafted by the International Federation on Ageing. So our organisation has been working at the coalface to try and improve the quality of life for older people across the globe since its inception. And certainly that is the priority of our organisation. And we work very closely with the UN. We have five representatives in New York. We have one in Geneva, one in Vienna. Um, And we work very closely with WHO. And most of our programs very much focus around the four pillars that WHO frames their work on. So it's ageism, um, long-term care, age-friendly cities and communities, and primary and integrated health care. So they're some of the areas that we particularly give some focus to. But when I think about um, the areas that we give some focus on, we talk about addressing inequality. So the individual's identity and lived experience has profound impact on the health and well-being of individuals as they age and often contributing to the inequalities um, across the life course. So addressing inequalities is really a focus of much of our work. Age-friendly environments, and I'll talk a little bit about age-friendly environments in the context that we provide a significant secretariat role for the World Health Organization and manage a lot of the age-friendly cities and communities Um, renewals, information across the world for all the cities that are part of that particular area. Yeah. Amazing amazing the work, the work and the collaboration, I think. Oh, it is. And, And, you know, WHO has been a really strong partner with us. We have a formal working agreement with them, which means we have a three year plan which gets signed off by WHO every three years, and that's got to be consistent with the plans that they're looking at or they're moving forward on. So the current plan 
our, our agreement fits very much with that. When I think about other areas, you know, applied technologies, how can technologies be implemented and better support older people as they age to really combat issues of loneliness and isolation? Exactly. I, yeah, it's, and I it's think all- we've seen, you know, a lot of that, especially around the COVID is, you know, using technology and, you know, as well, I mean, people like face to face, but also bringing that technology and it works it works for some yeah you know we've certainly um, heard some information and i can give an example of an older woman living in a long-term care facility in the netherlands where her experience with covid uh, and the lockdowns was that she had more contact with family members through technology than she had prior to the pandemic in uh, in in-person meetings so technology can play a significant role for people Yes, yes. Yeah, no, combat- thank you for, for answering well, that. I want to talk about combating ageism. Um, ageism really is one of the last isms that we really need to give some focus to. And um, if we can actually rally governments and people around the world to focus on ageism, um, it's going to be a significant benefit to older people because all of us uh, have some ageist attitudes in some way, shape or form. And it's how people actually identify and understand that, um, that we can start combating. Yes. And through, yes, definitely collaboration and resources and educating people. Um, And what does the IFA see as the most pressing aging issues and what is being done to address them? And also, can you speak on the work through the lens of the, I think you covered the four action areas, which you mentioned privately, the long-term care, the primary integrated care and ageism um, Mm. that the IFA is working on. And uh, I guess, what can we do that is clear and obvious and easily executed within our communities and throughout the world? Yeah, well, look, the pandemic really has... um, expose some gaping wounds in the long-term care sector um, across many countries. I mean, older people were those most significantly impacted in the early stages. And I think it really has been an eye-opener and an awakening for governments around the world to look at, well, how do we actually deal with this in the future? And if there's another pandemic, so what needs to be done around the quality of care standards, building infrastructure, Uh, the non-shared rooms and bathrooms in facilities. Um, I think that really has um, shown some of the weaknesses that we have. And we've only got to take Canada, for example, where the majority of the deaths early in the pandemic were people in long-term care. And I've often said that if you've got a minimum standard in a long-term care facility of one bathroom per 25 residents, how can you actually minimise infection, or how do you manage infection control and minimise infections um, when people are having to share uh, bathrooms? Yes. And yeah. it's an issue, issue that Australia, when I was with the government in Australia, we dealt with 30 years ago. So I don't know why governments haven't got on board and really looked at building standards. Yes. So, I remember, yes, the conversation that we had about that. And, you know, I mean, lots of issues. Our long-term care needs more funding, uh, more expertise uh, and education for the PSWs, more staffing, uh, more implementation uh, of person-centered care and that the person matters. Um, The community trying to keep them connected for those people in long-term care, there is a disconnect to the community. And, you know, so, so there are many, many different things that need to be worked on, I think. Yeah, but I think, you know, as people age and particularly the next cohort of older people, um, how many people want to go into a long-term care facility? Or how many people would prefer to be supported at home? So are governments giving priority to home care support programs and funded services? And it's not just about post-acute care, it's about the social determinants of ageing, being able to support people in their own homes through funded programs to minimise the risk of them having to go into long-term care. And that's certainly um, the case for Ontario and more broadly Canada 
our focus has been very much on the built environment rather than supporting people at home. In the community. In in Toronto, I mean, I know Dr. Samir Sinha, and there's the accountability table and the aging strat- strategy, aging in place. Um, you know, but again, we need more more funding to go out to the communities, um, more organizations providing the care. I mean, not everybody can afford home care, right? Um, so how how are we going to do that? And and perhaps I guess the long term care I think needs to be more a holistic model of care. And yeah, there might be like a lot of people in long term care that really don't need to be there. But if they had the supports in the community, yeah, um, and that's that's the problem, Joan, that they don't have the supports in the community. And it doesn't necessarily have to be an expensive option for older people. Um, so to give you an example. My mother was supported at home for uh, a number of years through what was called a community aged care package. Um, it cost it cost my mother. This is going back 15 years ago, but it it cost uh, I think around 50 45 dollars a week uh, for her, which she contributed. Um, the agency that provided the service got funding directly from the federal government based on the care package, and she received around between nine and 11 hours of direct care supports per week for that funding package. And that doesn't exist here. Um, So governments need to look at, well, who's doing it well around the world and what, how can we learn from each other? Exactly. Even even within Canada, how can we learn from one province to another that might be getting something right rather than saying we can do it better? Or, or yes, or organization. So that's why, you know, the collaboration is certainly key. And I guess the processes within organizations and what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what is the IFA's experience with working with countries around the world in addressing um, aging issues? And well, yeah, look, a lot of our work focuses on a number of different areas. So Uh, Trying to improve vaccine uptake rates globally is one of the key priorities for the IFA, particularly more relevant now because we know, you know, vaccines um, is as useful as clean water. Um, If we can reduce uh, morbidity through vaccination, uh, reduce disease, um, it certainly enables a person to lead a much more healthy life. And when you think about some of, um, if we look back at, Um, issues for older people and we think about function rather than frailty um, or age for argument's sake um, what contributes to the decline in function and it really is short-term illnesses and it could be uh, pneumococcal pneumonia Mm -hmm. influenza all of those things contribute to the decline in function of an older person so vaccines play a really significant and important role um, to improve the health and well-being. But thinking about function, you've got to think about um, brain health yes. um, and the impact that that has on function, oral health and the impact that that has on function, bone health, for argument's sake, which is an area which isn't spoken about a lot here no. in Canada, but in other countries it is, um, through maintaining good bone density and bone health maintains function functional capacity of older people as they age. So they're some of some of the things that we're certainly looking at. Age-friendly cities, of course, um, is a significant uh, impact. And trying to align healthcare systems so that no yes. one's left. Yes. Yeah. I think also the falls risk analysis and, and doing work on that as well, keeping people finding out a little bit more about the person on falls risk, uh, yeah. especially within the home care. I, I think that's an area that is lacking. Um, so we're trying to do a bit more work with, with regards to assessments on falls risks. Um, yeah. You know, ag- oh. again, brain health and, and finding out, you know, about the person a little bit more. Um, and then how, as we as humans have been collaborating and do we lack resources Do we lack the will or do we lack the coordination and a framework for working together? 
um, and perhaps here speak on the global cafe conferences, uh, the Zoom calls that the IFA has. And, I, you know, that's my highlight of the week is, is who is going to be speaking. And, you know, just understanding different models and resources, um, you know, the infrastructure, the processes that different people are doing, listening to the academics speaking or community agency. So I think this global cafe has, you know, has certainly been a plus over COVID in bringing people together. Look, look, when you're talking about making systemic change within an aged care setting or environment, we can't do it alone. We're not an island. And the only way to actually achieve decent results is work to work collaboratively. Bring on partners and unlike partners, you know, we're an ageing organisation, but we will work very closely with the World Blind Foundation. We will work with the diabetes associations because they don't have, while they'll be talking about disease specific, they don't necessarily think about older people as part of their cohort or in, within their cohort, um, but it's a significant proportion. So you need to be thinking about how do you work together across sectors, across disciplines, but also how do you engage with the private sector because none of these changes can happen um, without working together. And the global cafes, I think, have been a stimulus for some discussions, some dialogue, some best practice, which is happening around the world, and it gives the opportunity for people to showcase what they've done, what they're doing, but learn from some experts to see what can be done in other parts of the world. Um, it's really fascinating uh, to see the differences in um, some countries to another. Um, you know that Jane Barrett, the Secretary General, sits on the COVAC, WHO COVAX committee. Um, she was just saying yesterday that there are three countries within Africa that haven't distributed one vaccine yet. Wow. Um, so, you know, it's how do we get equity across all nations and across all populations within nations. And I think for too long, older people have been sort of cast aside. We're past our use-by date. So it doesn't really matter about the older people. We need to worry about younger people. Yes. Thailand, when they are looking at um, COVID-19 and the distribution of vaccines, their focus straight away was on young people, not old people. So older people were bore the brunt of COVID-19 in, in Thailand purely because of government response and policy around who should be being vaccinated first. Yes. Yeah. Very, I don't know that this pandemic has, <laughs> it's still going on, isn't it? I don't know. It's, it's yeah, difficult, it's, but it's going on. And look, I think we'll be living with COVID-19 for years and years. Yes. Um, it's not something that's just going to disappear. And it wouldn't surprise me if in two years' time, when you go to get your annual flu shot, it's also go flu shot. It's also going to have a COVID nineteen yes. boost out of that. So, yes, most definitely. And yeah, you know, it's something that we need to be conscious about, live with. But there's been some good sides to COVID. Not necessarily good sides, but when you think about the number of people that have uh, in countries where it's been winter, and I think of the southern hemisphere, the number of people that have got the flu. Um, on an annual basis, very, very low numbers. Number of people that have died from influenza, very low numbers. And that's purely because more people are conscious about um, PPE. And wearing uh, their yeah. masks. Yes, it was actually the lowest, I think, um, this year, like with the yes. flu. Yep. And uh, so that's something that I think we can all take away and learn from, that you can minimise some of these risks by... Um, the safety protocols that we've, we've had and put in place. Yeah. Um, not to say that I'm, I'm looking forward to going out to restaurants with groups of people. I want to um, yes. be safe at the same time. Um, and just on another point, are, are there things that the IFA could do differently? And is there a need for more organizations like the IFA or at least more funding? And if you had more funding, where would you spend it and what would you spend it on? <laughs> Uh, look, um, one would argue that there's never enough funding in the aged care sector or the system. Um, you know, we've been around since 1973, so nearly coming up to 50 years. Um, 
there's four organisations at the UN with general consultative status that deal with ageing and ageing issues. Um, we do work globally and some of those work globally as well. It's not necessary that we need more organisations like the IFA. What we need is more organisations prepared to stand up and work collectively to improve the systems for older people. And I've only got to think about the United Nations Convention for the Rights of Older People, how long that has been talked about. And we've had uh, a rap special rapporteur for a number of years, but we're still no closer. And I think it's time, it's, not, it's all civil society needs to be stepping up and talking yes. about the rights of older people. Yes, exactly. But often, you know, I, we, work, we have a number of, you know, recent graduates in public health, um, and I, I often talk to them about the rights of people with disabilities and how long that convention took before that got ratified at the UN. And it was about 25 years from when they first started talking about it to when it got ratified. We're only half, not even halfway there yet um, in terms of our dialogue around ageing. So we're hoping that will be much quicker. But rights for older people are human rights for everyone um, yes. and something that really has to be addressed. And that's one of the areas that we will be talking about at uh, the IFA. At the IFA. Conference, yeah. Just a, a little bit, I mean, I was just wanting to mention about social capital and I guess the positives of organizations and communities coming together to prob problem solve. And, you know, again, I think with a lot of the academics and researchers and people from around the world, th that type of approach is happening on the global cafes that I see. You know, people are putting in different information on chats. You've had... Um, different speakers from both from Canada and uh, around the world. You've had um, Professor Tara Keck, who uh, did a presentation on challenges and opportunities for promoting healthy aging, uh, loneliness. You had Dr. Bei Wu, which was very interesting. She's the Dean's Professor in Global Health Director for Global Health and Aging Research at NYU. And she was speaking on long-term care, person-centered care. And she is also part of the We Thrive group, um, yeah. which Mosaic has just started with as well, is, you know, looking at the long-term care talking about person-centeredness as well. So that is an amazing group. And another person that I really enjoyed was Miss Natalie Turner, Head of Locality Centre for Aging in Better UK. And uh, our very own Lisa Levin, who's the CEO of Advantage Ontario, discussing about the long-term care, relational care, and person-centered care. So I think that collaboration of, of, of different people from all around the world is, is certainly beneficial. And hopefully, the Global Cafe hopefully will continue in some form of another as, as uh, we, I guess, move out of, of covid well, they will continue because we see them as a really valuable resource to be able to still connect people um, because it's not often that you get to be able to connect with people across the globe. So it really is an important vehicle for us and that to be able to drive that conversation and those relationships because I think a lot of people get a lot out of it. And the, the advantage is that all of the sessions are recorded just like this session is being recorded. They're all available on the IFA website. Um, all people need to do is look at news and resources and, and go to the Global Cafe. And you can look at all the sessions that you've just mentioned um, and listen to the dialogue, listen to the questions, see the questions and responses from those experts. Um, this week, we're yes. talking about homelessness in parks. So yes. in conversation with Dr Amanda O'Rourke, executive uh, director of um, 80 cities. So it really is, you know, it's a diverse group of people, but it's a diverse group of topics, but always with a focus on older people. I, you know, some of the um, discussions on the Global Cafe, I've shared with our staff at Mosaic as well, because I think some of them are very interesting for them to hear. Um, 
because I think s- some people in, in agencies might be disconnected. They're not really understanding what's happening around the rest of the world. And I think it's wonderful education and wonderful that the IFA provides that and provides the taping online. So I make reference to, to that if, if I'm speaking to any academics or uh, individuals or community agencies within Toronto. I'm saying go to the IFA website and uh, they have some wonderful information. Well, you know, I've, I've got to make a comment about Mosaic. Um, look, in in my time in Toronto and Canada, um, you're one of the most active organisations in the community with a really strong focus and emphasis on, on the individual and their needs and what they want to get. I think organisations like, like you can showcase to many yes. others what can be done and can be achieved. Yes. But I think, again... Um, totally under-resourced in terms of government support and government funding. Um, And the interesting thing that I find here in Canada is the discussion, particularly around the private profits and the not-for-profit sector, Um, whereas in many other countries, they're not treated any differently. They're treated the same. They've got to, they receive the same funding. They've got to meet the same standards. They've got to meet the same outcomes. Yes. Um, And... Equally, you'll, they'll, the governments will close down a private for profit provider or a church and charitable provider if they fail standards and quality. Yes. Within. No. Well, th- thank you for that. And, you know, I think one thing that ha- has come out of COVID, a positive, <laughs> if you can, if you can say that is, is definitely the collaboration and, you know, Mosaic with, with other uh, home care organizations, community organizations, is that we've had a lot of discussion online on Zoom. And we've had to sort of work together and, you know, find out what other organizations are doing in in these crises, you know, share about our processes, um, information about PPE. And in fact, within the government in the beginning of COVID, really private home care, the discussion was long-term care and uh, retirement. So the home care and the community agencies that were providing majority of the care in the home care were just not getting the information. And we had to work extremely hard to look at best practices from around the world with regards to PPE, contact mm-hmm. tracing. So it, it, um, it was quite uh, hectic. So I think the collaboration and the social capital is, is extremely important in moving forward and I think creating change and, and, and learning how to work together, both the profit and the not-for-profit. And because uh, there's great models out there from, from all organizations that we can learn from. There, there definitely are. Now, one of the questions you asked in the last was, what could we do differently? What could the IFA yes. do differently? I think, you know, we try and look at what are some of the things which is going to improve functional capacity of older people? And what are the programs and services which governments particularly don't necessarily look at? And how can we get those elevated to the extent where governments see those things as a priority? So bone health, um, oral care for older people, um, adult vaccination programs, uh, age-friendly cities, all of those things add to improving functional capacity of older people. And I think they're some of the things, while I wouldn't say we need to do them differently, we need to give them more focus and elevate them more. I mean, we've only just started talking about bone health. And it's interesting, I listened to a Perth, Western Australia radio station in the evening. And um, in the hour or hour and a half that I would listen to it, I would hear two to four um, stories, or not stories, but um, promotions around older people getting bone density checks um, because of the importance of that. But I don't hear about it here. Yes, that's what that's. uh, Yes, we had mentioned that in in conversations. I think we need to get better at that. And vision health. I mean, how many how many people in long term care get their vision tested? Yes. When we know that 70 percent of of vision loss can be um, overcome or be dealt with in different ways if people are looked at and treated early in the piece. Diabetic retinopathy, 
has a huge impact on people as they age because we know diabetes is a significant yes. uh, illness for many older people. But people don't know what the impact of retinopathy is going to be um, as part of that uh, diabetes life course. So, yes. Wow. Yeah. Lots of, I mean, we, we could have a discussion for <laughs> hours on the different issues. But I'd like to get back to the IFA, the 15th Global Conference on Aging Rights Matter that is coming up in uh, November the 9th to the 12th. And this is held virtually and in person, Niagara Falls, Canada. And uh, Greg, can you just describe a little bit about the conference and preparing for the conference in a COVID <laughs> environment? Oh, look, in a COVID, look, the conference, this is the third date um, for the conference. So we've had to cancel the conference previously on two occasions, but we decided that we would go ahead. Normally our conferences are in person, but we've acquired a, a platform to uh, make it a really good experience virtually. So currently we have about 1,200 delegates, which will be attending the conference from around 68 countries at the moment. Wow, amazing. Uh, Around um, around seven or eight hundred of those will be virtual delegates, and around four hundred will be in person in Niagara Falls. Um, again, we're very much aligned with WHO and the impact of COVID nineteen. So it's based around five themes: ageism being one, age friendly cities and communities, primary health care, long term care, and older people and pandemics because we know the resilience of older people and what role do they play and can play in pandemics and what can we learn from older people in that. But when I think about ageism, you know, and if I talk about ageism or the stereotyping, stereotyping how we think, prejudice about how we feel and discrimination about how we act towards a person based on their age. And I think ageism is pervasive in every country. And really, I think it's something that really needs to be addressed. And part of WHO's report is that it being addressed. Um, so that's certainly a strong focus of the conference. We've got lots of abstracts around ageism. Um, we've also got lots of, you know, we've got an age friend, a pre-conference program happening on the 8th of November. Yes. So that's looking at um, age-friendly cities, uh, and environments. We've got a hearing summit, so looking at the hearing loss of older people and the impact that has on functional capacity. Um, we have two workshops, one on um, long-term care and frailty and one on ageism being run by World Health Organization. We've got some fantastic yeah. stuff. Um, no, it's it it's like amazing. That. I guess, yeah. when was the last conference? Uh, that was in Toronto. In Toronto in 2019. Yes, yeah. that was an amazing, uh, amazing conference. I also know that there will be some discussion on social prescribing. Um, yes. And also Mosaic is actually having an information table. So for those that are attending the IFA conference, we will be having a table. And yeah. we will also be presenting a paper abstract and addressing the domains of home and community care within an empathic model of person-to-person -person and environment interaction. We yeah. also have Theatre in the Web that will be doing a short performance taped on what it means to be a human being. And uh, I actually had sent the presentation or video off to the IFA and um, it is a very moving piece. And I've also shared it with uh, our elder abuse uh, group in North York as well. Um, so they thought it was amazing, very heartwarming, empathic. Oh, look, and, and I've seen the shorts from the group and I'm looking forward to seeing the presentations in Niagara Falls. Um, I'm looking forward to it immensely. So it'll be, it'll be really good. Um, yes. I've got no doubt a lot of people will take a lot away from it. We've got a really star lineup of people that will be coming in person to the to the conference and presenting. You know, we've got Madame Bachelet, which will be talking about rights. With it looks like we may have the Secretary General for the United Nations doing a video opening for the conference. We've got a number of people from World Health Organization running masterclasses on ageism, um, the ICOAT program for older people. They will be in attendance. But some of the abstracts that we have are just remarkable. Yes. And I'm looking 
Martin Ford, John Muscadier and the Frailty Network, we were talking about that particular piece of work around long-term care and frailty. So it's going to be an interesting four days. And it's, um, I think, as well, that, again, coming together face-to-face for those people that are coming to the conference, you know, just, I think, meeting from different people around the world and having conversations again, uh, you know, is definitely something that I've missed. And, yeah. and, and that learning and listening to the different models and the ways that people are doing things, you know, for, for, you know, for older persons in their communities and throughout the world. As, as you can imagine, uh, most of the delegates that will be in person will probably be from Canada and the United States, although I can tell you that we um, have what's, have a delegate attending from Kenya. We have people coming, uh, a delegation potentially coming from Ghana, UK, Netherlands. Terrific. So there's, so there's a, a good spread of people which will be doing in person as well. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to those four days. It should be yes. Amazing. Yes, I'm looking forward to it. And I just wanted to say, you know, a big thank you, uh, Greg, for agreeing to be guest on our Community Life in Canada podcast. We really appreciate your time and discussion, especially I know how busy you are definitely with the conference and and getting things together. Uh, Greg, how would you how would our listeners find out about the IFA? Could you provide your contact information and about the conference, how they would find out about it? So the main website for the IFA is www.ifa.ngo. That will get you to our main website. For the conference, it is www.ifa2021 for the conference website. Um, And if people want to make contact with me, my email address is gshaw, S-H-A-W, at ifa.ngo. And I'm be pleased to listen and talk to any of the podcast listeners at any time. And thank you, Greg Shaw, for for coming on to our podcast today. And for our listeners, stay tuned for our next podcast coming out in a couple of months featuring Raza Mira, Network Manager for NICE on the Home Sharing Initiative. You can also subscribe to Mosaic's Community Life Podcast in Canada, either on Google or Apple. And thank you, listeners.